I hate to break this up. Good morning, Saints of First Church. Good morning. Good morning. It is a joy to see you in God's house on this beautiful Sunday morning. We're glad all of you are with us today, especially those who are visiting. We ask all of you, whether you're a first-time visitor, a long-time member, or somewhere in between, if you'll sign the registration pad that you find at the end of your row, that we might have a record of your attendance with us on this Lord's Day. We'd appreciate that. We're thrilled that you're with us. Let me share with you just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, you have uh, in your bulletin an insert as we continue to participate in the work of recovery and, uh, and repairs and things of that nature after the effects of Hurricane Florence, especially in light of the damage of Michael. Uh, we have some ways that you can be involved. Obviously, we want to continue to pray. There are means by which you may give. And let me say to you, I did a little calculation uh, in all the various avenues that we have the opportunity to give toward the recovery efforts for Florence. Uh, in the last uh, three weeks or so, I believe our church has given a little bit over $10,000. That's tremendous. And, uh, and we give God the glory for that, and it's doing a lot of really good work. Uh, it's important for us to do that, especially in the light of Michael, because resources will have to be diverted to other areas as well. So we want to try to continue to, to do what we can to help in our own situation too. So that's a very good thing. Um, there are a couple of changes. Chrysalin's needs have changed a little bit. They don't need the money anymore. What they're looking for is desserts. Mm -hmm. They're going to try to keep sending food to, uh, to Wilmington and they need desserts. And I know there's nobody in this congregation, Aunt Cherry, that knows how to make desserts. <laughs> right? If you feel led to contribute to that effort, we want to encourage you to do that. Also, our emergency response teams are beginning to get requests for people to come in and do some work. And if you're interested in being a part of a team that goes into places, particularly like, I think we've been hearing from places like Bellhaven, particularly, uh, Brother Tom Jacobs is one of our uh, emergency response team leaders, and you have his contact information. Let him know that you're willing to go and be a part of one of those teams that goes to help in the need. Uh, so just let him know, and he'll be glad to, to work with you on that. Uh, remind you about Wednesday night supper coming up this coming Wednesday. You got the menu there. It's a wonderful time of good food and fellowship. If you've never been to one, you owe it to yourself to do so. Just come out and have a good time with us. Uh, we had a wonderful time last Sunday evening. Uh, we had about 80 people to gather as we started our married couple curriculum together, our, our married couple time together. Enjoyed a lot of things we learned. Not to anticipate the worst, but to believe the best. best. There we go. There we go. We had a wonderful time. And one of the things that they encourage in, in the uh, curriculum is to have a date night. Now, they say a cheap date night. I don't think we need to put it that way. Um, <laughs> inexpensive, frugal, something else. Cheap just saying. Anyway, <laughs> well, you want to spend time with each other. That's a very important thing. Uh, and if you would like to, to make tonight that night, uh, there's an opportunity to do so with child care being provided here at the church from 5 to 7. If you're interested in that, uh, you'll contact uh, uh, the, the folks and let them know. Uh, that would be very helpful. I uh, want to remind you also about an event coming up at the end of this month. On the 28th of October, we will gather over in Wesley Hall at 9 o'clock. We'll have a, a brief time of devotion, and then we will go out and be the church as the church leaves the building to go out to be involved in our community. We have several projects that are lined up. We've got a church from Cary that's actually going to come and be a part of it with us. Uh, we want to encourage you all to come out. Uh, there, uh, Tom, do we have the projects out here in the hallway? I believe so. Sometimes. Okay, they may be out here. I know they're over in Wesley Hall. Uh, we've got things like uh, visiting shut-ins. Uh, there's a project that you may not know about here in the town called I Live Alone. Uh, the police department coordinates that, and there are some people who live by themselves who need some work done, and we're going to take on some of that. Several different things. And then at 6 o'clock on the 28th, well, God's people on Sunday got to be in church, right? We're going to gather together and worship together over in Wesley Hall. We're going to sing praise songs. We're going to get together and worship God and celebrate the work that God has done in us and through us on that day. So it's going to be a wonderful day. We want to encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, are there other announcements that need to be lifted up? Yes. Oh, yes, yes ma'am. The circle of Mary and Martha. That's right. 
Uh, and, you know, when you when you, you may say, "Well, I'd love to go out and work, Ken." but I won't be able to get lunch on the table. We got that taken care of too. The Circle of Mary and Martha will be providing box lunches for $5, is that correct? So you can work, do the project, come back by the church and pick up your lunch and help another project and go home, put your feet up for about 10 minutes and come back and worship. That's going to be a full day, but it's going to be a good day. So we hope you'll be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, okay, that's another thing. Uh, we're going to have, a, 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 you know, Methodists love to eat. And we're going to eat on the 16th of November. Uh, it's sort of our modified version of Fall Flame. Uh, and there'll be tickets. Do you have tickets? Um, the tickets have been distributed. So if you're looking for a ticket for a really good chicken dinner, let me tell you, it's really good. Because uh, the preacher helps with it, so it's got to be good. Uh, but if you're interested, Alma and some other people have tickets, and you certainly can contact the church office, and we'll we'll hook you up. They're ten dollars a piece. Is that correct? There we go. Other announcements. It is good to see you in God's house. Let us prepare our hearts and minds now for worship. I invite you now to stand as you're able as we join together in our call to worship that you find printed in your bulletins. Let our feet hold fast to the ways of God. And let us treasure God's word in our hearts. Let's join now together in the opening prayer. Almighty God, we call upon your name this day. When you seem most absent, we yearn to hear your voice. When you seem most present, we long to follow your teachings. Be with us now, strengthen and guide us, that we may trust your call and follow your leading. In doubt, in trust, but most of all in hope, we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 101 in your hymnals, From All That Dwell Below the Sky.
faith. It's number 881 in the back of your hymnals. It is the Apostles' Creed. Let us together unite in this historic confession of our Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He arose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As God's people gather together in God's house, let us turn and exchange signs of his love and peace with one another. Yeah, yeah he's in the back back there. He's, he's doing good. Oh, good. Nope. Shalom. Now I normally come up and say this is a time for the young disciples, but we actually have a special presentation this morning uh, from the children and from the SPRC committee. Uh, so, yes. So could we have... Could we have Pastor Ken and Pastor Stephen up here? And Ms. Lori, you can join too. Good morning. I'm Lori Zellinger, representing Staff Parish Relations Committee. And I'd like to. Um, okay, I think I can hear you. Anyway, our, our chairperson, Keith Mason, was unable to be here today. But anyway, um, I'm representing, and we have representatives from each, uh, at each service today. I'd also like to ask any other members of this committee who are here to come down front, and then anyone in this congregation who would like to stand in support of our pastors, if you would either stand with you or come down front, that would be great. We can't hear you. We can't hear you at all. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay, I would like... I'm representing Staff Parish Relations Committee because our chairperson could not be here today. So I'd like for other members of that committee to come down front, if you will, um, and just join me during this presentation. And anyone in the church congregation this morning who would like to stand in support of our pastors, please come down also. Or you can stand where you are. Can you go first? 
in support of the past. So before the SPRC presentation uh, happens, um, our children last week, while the marriage encounter was going on, created some special gifts for each of you. Um, so that's just a way of saying our thanks and our appreciation for all that you do in our lives. Thank you, Drew. I have um, a resolution, appreciation proclamation written by Keith Mason representing our committee, but it, I'm sure it represents everyone here. Friends and fellow members of First United Methodist Church, I bring you greetings from the Staff Parish Relations Committee, on whose behalf I have the honor of proclaiming our collective appreciation of not only this committee, but the entire church, as represented by the congregations of all three services for both our senior pastor, Ken Hall, and our associate pastor, Stephen Bazan, as a member of this church for over 30 years, I can honestly say that during my time here, we've always been blessed to have excellent pastors. We have all been endowed, they have all been endowed by God with many different gifts. Some gifts more pronounced and apparent in certain individuals than others, but each one a complete and entirely capable spiritual leader in their own right. Each one has been a source of enlightenment, faith, stewardship, Christian action, and love for all people, just to name a few of their common traits and gifts. The two current occupants of these offices are in no uh, wise deficient in any of these gifts. That sounds impressive, doesn't it? Yeah. But rather than lavished upon us the excess of their talents to our great benefit. But we too, as the body of Christ, have received gifts from our Heavenly Father, as the Apostle Paul instructs us in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. And I quote, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Therefore, on this Pastor Appreciation Sunday, we lift up our hearts to the Lord in thanks for his blessings embodied by Ken and Stephen, for their steadfast devotion to this awesome responsibility which Paul declares. On behalf of the entire church, we say thank you. Recognizing how inadequate these words are to express the depth of our gratitude and appreciation for your selfless service to our church and to our greater community. We love you even as we know we are loved by you. We also know that these faithful shepherds could not perform their duties to the high degree they have demonstrated without the constant love and support of their respective spouses. So Carrie Hall and Amanda Bazan, ladies, we appreciate you for all you do as well. May God continue to bless the First United Methodist Church. Now, is there anyone here who would like to offer another word of tribute or appreciation or support? Okay, then would you step down so we can pray for you? <laughs> Our Father in heaven, we come to you with great joy and appreciation today, not only for our church and the many ministries that um, we work through here each day, but we are extremely thankful for our pastors, Ken and Stephen. We thank you, Lord, for sending them here. We thank you for the many ways they reflect your Holy Spirit in everything that they do. Lord, help us to be mindful to always pray for them and to check on them and to make sure that they have their needs met as well. So let us be your hands and feet. Let us be your active participants in this ministry with them as we partner with them to do your will in this community and to build up the body of Christ. And may it all be to your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.
I know a special place where this will go in my office. Yep. Uh, now we now enter into this time of um, thanksgiving and praise for what God has given us and a time for us to, to bear our hearts with one another um, as we, we pray for one another. Uh, I know of a... Um, did you mention the, what we've given as a church yes. during the announcements? Yes. I just think that's worth, that's worth lifting yes. up as a praise again. Not that we're supposed to be proud as a church, but, but that's, that's something, saying that they, what God is doing in us and through us is, is um, to be able to raise that amount of money for, for folks, that uh, those of us who, who weren't uh, necessarily affected. I just think that's worth living, lifting up in praise this morning. I also want to remind you that Judy Cheshire um, will be undergoing surgery this week as well as Rob, I think he's back there, there he is. Um, we want to pray for you as well as you're, you're going undergoing surgery this week um, too. Are there other praises or concerns uh, to be lifted up today? Stephen, uh, it's, yes. good, it's good to see Fred Benson and his beautiful bride yeah. this morning. Hey Fred, hey, good Fred. to see you. <laughs> Sometimes when we're up here passing the peace, you can't get all the way back there and say hi, so we've got to shout it out. Good to see you. Others? Well, let us now um, go to the Lord in prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> o God of infinite patience and wisdom, we come to you this day with so many things that claim our time, our energy, our resources, and our very lives. We are easily drawn away from serving you by the enticements of this world for wealth, for ease, for comfort. Just like the man in the scriptures in Mark, we are owned by our possessions, held captive by our treasures. But you continue to offer to us healing and hope. You speak to transform our lives from captivity to freedom in witness and in service. We look at the world in which there are so much warfare and strife, anger and hatred, and we easily become overwhelmed by the needs and our stresses. Help us to place our lives and our trust in you, knowing that with your help, Many wonderful things can be accomplished, which will provide hope and peace for others and ourselves. Give us courage and strength to truly be your disciples. For we ask this in Jesus' name, and with the confidence of the one who taught us to commune with our Maker, we pray now. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward as we give thanks to God and we give back to God his tithes, our gifts, and offerings.
standing, if you will, as we join together in another hymn, number 144 in your hymnals, 144. This is My Father's World. You may be seated.
God's people said, Amen. Amen. It's good to see you. It is good to be seen. I miss being with you. Carrie and I miss being with you last Sunday. We were in lovely Macon, North Carolina. And you say, there's a Macon in North Carolina? Yes, there is. In Warren County, Macon uh, was one of the three churches I started out at as a student. Uh, when I was at the Divinity School at Duke, I was uh, pastoring three churches in Warren County, and Macon was one of them. And I had the opportunity to go back last Sunday to show some of those dear souls that their efforts were not in vain, that, that I turned out halfway decent, and it was wonderful to be with them. Uh, it was a little bittersweet uh, because I could look out in the congregation and see places where people I knew and loved had sat who were not there anymore, and that was, that was, a, little, that was a little tough. Uh, it, it got started, uh, there was a group who came to sing, and they uh, did uh, the, the old gospel song, Life is Like a Mountain Railway. Uh, some of you may or may not know, but Bishop Edwards, one of our former bishops, that was his favorite song. And when we celebrated his retirement, a uh, group sang that, and uh, I thought the world of Bishop Edwards. And to think of him, and he no longer with us, and that song, that got, got a hold of me. And then to get up and see folks not there anymore, that got a hold of me. So I had to straighten it out. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a good time to be among God's people, but it was good to see the Beaufort County line, too. Big grin on my face, I said, I'm home. Um, ironically, at the end of this particular passage that we're looking at today, the last couple of verses, talk about the disciples leaving mother and father and home to follow the master. And the master says, you're going to get paid back for that. And I realize now uh, how blessed I have been. I've been a wandering Aramean all my life. Uh, I've not had roots anywhere, um, it seems. Seven years, the longest I've ever lived anywhere, and it was in Chapel Hill. Can you imagine a Duke man, Chapel Hill, the longest I've ever lived anywhere <laughs> in the world. But how blessed I've been for the people who crossed my path that I would never have met. And that is a privilege that a hillbilly from East Tennessee, that's more than he could ever hope for. So thank you. Thank you very much. I also want to say a quick word of thanks to those of you who've asked about my mom. Some of you know that a couple weeks ago, mom fell, broke her wrist and or her hip leg. I'm not, I never have figured that out. But anyway, uh, she is at uh, rehabilitation, doing well. Got a few more days and then she'll go home and God help my father. Uh, <laughs> Fortunately, my sister is nearby, so it'll, it shouldn't be too bad. But thank you for your prayers. She's very grateful for your prayers. And continue to pray for her as she continues to recover. So God bless you and thank you. Uh, some of you may wonder how Brother Stephen and I, and let me say very quickly, not only have I been blessed by the membership that I've been able to, to be around, but I've had some good people to work with. And I've got a good one now. I've got some good ones now. Thank all of y'all. You're loved and appreciated too. Uh, some of you may wonder where the texts we come up with come from, um, and I'll let you in on a little secret. Uh, there is a reading program, if you will, for lack of better terminology. It's a three-year cycle. It's called the Revised Common Lectionary. That means uh, you may talk to your Presbyterian friends tomorrow and say, what would you all hear in church yesterday? Well, we heard the same thing. Well, that's because we're using the same Revised Common Lectionary. And so we are in the B cycle of the Revised Common Lectionary, and that's where our text today comes from. It's the gospel text from Mark. Uh, it's the 10th chapter. We're looking at verses 17 to 27. Now, we're in that time of the church year and in the time of year when we began to think about God's goodness to us. Intently, we begin to think about it and about our response to his generosity to us through our generosity toward the work of the kingdom and through, uh, through our work in the world. And so as we do so, we find this passage coming to us. Uh, I think it has some really good things to say to us. Most of the time when you hear the preacher's going to talk a little bit about wealth and things like that, the people in the pews begin to squirm a little bit. And the people in the pulpit squirm a whole lot. But uh, this is some good stuff because it's talking to us not about necessarily things. It's talking about a way of life. 
is talking about a mindset and a heart set. And I think that's something that's significant and important to us in the fall of the year, in the spring of the year, in the dead of summer. So I hope that you will be blessed by this reading and this uh, reflection this morning. The text begins at verse 17. We're going to read through verse 27. And I want to invite you, if you have your Bible with you, to turn there. If you have your pew Bible, you may turn in that. And I want to invite you to give ear to the reading of the Word of God. And as he, meaning Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these things I have observed from my youth. And there are some translations that will read that from my birth. And Jesus, looking up upon him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. At that saying, his countenance fell. And he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is, how hard it will be for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished, and they said to him, Who can be saved then? Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Beloved, this is the word of God for the people of God in the house of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you once again this day for the opportunity to come together to open our hearts and our minds and our ears to hear what you have to say to us this day. Give us grace to take in your life-giving words and help us, Lord, to faithfully follow after you as a result. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen. The late comedian Fred Allen once said, There are a lot of things in this world that are more important than money. And they all cost money. <laughs> Doubtless there are some people who probably think that way. There are a lot of folks, if we were to ask everybody to be honest this morning, it might be surprising. There are a lot of folks who think to themselves, you know, my life would go so smoothly if I had just a little bit more money. Now, let's be honest. Have any of you ever daydreamed about the publisher's clearinghouse people coming to your door? <laughs> Don't leave me hanging. I know I'm not the only one. Oh, we'd give this much to the church to start with, and then we'd do this and this. I go and get gas a lot of times, and I'll be waiting to pay for the gas, and people will be in line ahead of me, and they are purchasing a whole bunch of lottery tickets because they're convinced that their numbers are going to hit, and their lives are going to be better. They're going to live the good life if they just win this lottery. Well, let me let you in on a little secret. That's not necessarily the case. A few years back, the Lottery Post ran a couple of stories about people who found that they didn't find a good life as a result of their good fortune. The first story was about a 25-year-old girl named Amanda Clayton. She won a million dollars in the Michigan lottery. A couple of years later, she was found dead in her home from a drug overdose. And then there was the case of Freddie Young, a man from Detroit, who won $1.57 million. A couple of years after that, he was sentenced to 20 to 35 years in prison for second-degree murder. Apparently, he got in a fight with his daughter's landlord over a back rent due 
of $1,000. $1.57 million, $1,000 wouldn't have been much to that, would it? So much for the good life, right? The truth of the matter is we often find that the things that promise us the good life might very well be the very things that prevent us from achieving the good life. In a sense, that's what Jesus is trying to, to reveal to us through this text this day. His encounter with this rich young man is a reminder to us that the blessings and benefits in our lives, if we're not careful, if we don't have a proper understanding of them, may very well prevent us from living abundantly here and now and eternally in the life to come. And at this time of year, as we begin to contemplate God's goodness to us and our response to that goodness through generosity, through stewardship, I want us to reflect on the Master's words here today as we come to an understanding of how we may, by grace through faith, thread the needle as a follower of Jesus. In the text, Jesus is approached by a wealthy young man. And as they say from where I come, sugar wouldn't melt in his mouth. He comes before Jesus and says, Oh, good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now this is a, a, a direct sort of a, 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 an opposite angle, if you will, of the Pharisees and the scribes who often approach Jesus with these rhetorical, theological questions that are designed to be traps to get him in trouble. This rich young fellow has come forward and asked a very sincere question. And I think Jesus senses that, but he wants to, to gauge it a little bit. He wants to stretch it out and try to find out this young man's level of commitment and his, his real interest in what's going on here. And so he says to the young man, well, you know the commandments, don't you? To which the young fellow says, oh yeah, I know the commandments, and I kept all of them, as I said in one version, it says, from my birth. So he honored his mom and daddy at three days old. That mean he slept through the night, let them get a good night's sleep? Is that how that worked? <laughs> this is a good guy, right? And the scriptures say something very wonderful here. It's beautiful. They say, he says that Jesus loved him. He, he knows this guy's looking for something. It's something only he can give the guy. But Jesus then says something really radical. He says, okay, okay. I'll tell you what. I want you to go home, take all your stuff, sell it, and give the money to the poor, and then you come follow me, and we'll talk about this as we go forward. The scriptures tell us at that point the young man was crestfallen. You ever seen anybody that's crestfall? Must make a lot of noise. But he was crestfallen, and he walked away because he had many possessions. And then Jesus turns and says that really sharp saying. He says, I say to you that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's a pretty hard saying. And I think it's something sometimes that we have not had the proper understanding of. I think people look at that and they may wonder, now, is Jesus saying here that it's a sin to be prosperous and to have money? Is it a sin to do well? By no means. No. There are some people who might want to use this passage as a means to justify class warfare, but the truth of the matter is that the scriptural witness and the history of the church is filled with examples of people who have been very well off financially, who have been excellent disciples, excellent servants of God through Jesus Christ. You see, the problem is not prosperity. The problem is prosperity's effects on us. There's nothing wrong with being blessed in a material sense. At the same time, we have to acknowledge the truth that if we don't have a proper handle on this situation, if we don't properly understand the blessing that's been laid upon us and how we are to use it for God's glory, then we may very well come to a point where we are unable, to paraphrase our Lord, to thread the needle as a disciple. Now what sort of dangers are we looking at here? The blessings in our life 
can be a danger to us spiritually if we place more value on things than we do people and relationships. If you place more value on things in your life than people, you're in trouble, spiritually speaking. The July-August 1999 issue of Fast Company magazine asked the readers, if I could give you one extra hour a day with your family or a $10,000 raise, which would you choose? The survey results came back. 17% chose the time. 83% of the people surveyed said we want the money. That money that after Uncle Sam gets done with it, you're not going to get 10000 for sure. That money that will disappear is more important than the people in your life. Where are your priorities? For some people, the answer is simple. They're more interested in gathering up the things of this world, the things that this world says gives you status, than they are in cultivating the relationships that bind us together. And there are a lot of people who've pursued those profits rather than the people, and it's led to disastrous results. December 2003, there was a presentation from the Public Radio International Media Group that talked about the little Pacific Island nation of Nauru, in the early 1900s, it was discovered that Nauru was a tremendous resource for phosphates. There was phosphate all over that island. And the Nauruans decided they would let people come in and mine the phosphate, and they would get the money. By the 1980s, this little itty-bitty island in the Pacific Ocean had a higher per capita standard of living than any nation in the world. But by the 1990s, things were different. Most of the money was gone through bad investment, through extravagant spending, and through political corruption. To make matters worse, the island had been so mined, it basically was a strip mine. And it led the folks in the government to actually consider having to look for another place to relocate the people. Jack Hyatt, writing the article, said this. He said, those Nauruans actually sold their homeland, the ground under their feet, for a pot of money that was no longer there. How many people do you and I know this morning who stand amid the toxic ruins in their lives because they chose the pursuit of things over the fostering and the nurturing of relationships with the people in their lives and above all, a relationship with God in Christ Jesus? Friends, if it's more important for us to have things that are here today and gone tomorrow, I have to say this, we were driving down 158 to Macon last Sunday morning, and Macon, which is a little town, basically deserted, they have a mini storage place. Those folks in that remote county in North Carolina have so much stuff, they have to have a place to store it. If that's more important to us than cultivating those relationships that make our lives worth living, then friends, we're, we're guilty of maybe missing the opportunity to thread the needle as a disciple of Jesus. The blessings in our life can also be a spiritual danger to us if we see them as an end rather than as a means. An end rather than a means. When the sole purpose of our living is to get up every morning and make a little more, we're in trouble, spiritually speaking. Again, there's nothing wrong with being blessed. In fact, I'll even go as far as to say this. I think we honor God when we make the most of our time, talent, opportunities, and treasure. He's the one that gave it to us. And when we do good with it, we honor Him. As long as we do it in a moral and ethical way. But what you've got to understand is you weren't born to be an amasser or a gatherer or an atomized economic unit to support the popular culture. You were made to be a disciple, a servant who followed the, the example of the master servant who came not to be served, 
but to serve. The blessings in our lives are not an end unto themselves. Rather, they are a means that allow us to live more fully into the call that the Master puts on us to follow Him and to go into the world and make disciples. Uh, I read an article where someone interviewed the fellow Ken Blanchard who formed the, the Blanchard Group. It's a, it's a talent uh, or leadership uh, uh, resource company. And Blanchard told this fellow, he said, we tithe 10% of our profit every year. We take it and we split it up among our employees and we tell them, you give this money to the good of, 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 our, of our culture, of our community. You use this money to do good. The least, the people who make the least amount of money in the company get $1,000 to give away. Those who make more money, they get $3,500. And Ken said it has made a tremendous difference in our company. We see things differently because we are reaching out and helping to make things better. He said a guy from the shipping dock came up to me with tears running down his cheeks. He was so grateful, so proud, because he was able to go to his church with a $1,000 check and give it to them so that they could buy choir robes. Sounds to me like that's a company that understands the true position that wealth ought to have. It's there to help us to be better servants, better givers, better bridge builders within our community. The great showman P.T. Barnum put it very succinctly but very powerfully when he said this. He said, money is a terrible master, but it is an excellent servant. Money is a terrible master, but it is an excellent servant. There's nothing wrong with being blessed, but it's not an end unto itself. It is a means by which we are able to be more faithful in our fellowship of the master and if we see it as an end if the reason we open our eyes every morning if our raison d'etre our reason for being is to make a little more we've got it wrong and we're going to miss threading that needle of discipleship in the name of Jesus the blessings in our life may also be a danger to us spiritually if we are willing to have in God we trust printed on our money, but not in our hearts. You see, that was the problem with this rich young ruler. He knew he was missing something, and that's why he went to Jesus, and he was right. And he was a good man. He was a respectable man, and, and he was a religious man. As a matter of fact, within the culture, the fact that he was a wealthy man was a sign of how how holy and how righteous that he was. But I think he thought that eternal life was a matter of acquisition. Remember what he said? He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a means of acquisition. It's a transaction that I have to engage in and I can get it for myself. What this young man didn't understand and what a lot of people in our world don't understand is that the grace they seek is free, but it's not cheap. It requires a complete reorientation of life. This young man was being called upon to reorient his life. Quit trusting in your merit, in your means, in your righteousness to get what you need and instead you put all of your trust in the goodness of God in Christ Jesus. And that's why Jesus said, go sell your stuff. You rely on it too much, and then you come follow me. And that's why the fellow had to walk away sorrowfully. You see, he was willing to give recognition and respect and even a, a little bit of devotion to the idea, but he was not willing to give his complete trust to the goodness of God in Christ Jesus. He just could not trust God for his life and for what he needed to do. Tim Hansel wrote a book entitled, When I Relax, I Feel Guilty. Anybody feel that way? In, in the book, he writes about what I think is the, the real relationship that a lot of people have in their minds with God today. 
It's entitled, I Would Like $3 Worth of God. It goes like this. I would like $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to keep me up at night, but enough to equate a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the summer sun. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want one pound of the Almighty in a paper sack. I would like $3 worth of God, please. You see, the real issue of this text People will read it and they read rich, young ruler and they say, well, that ain't me. Not young anymore. Not rich. But it applies to every single one of us. Because it's not a matter of money. It's a matter of faith. Jesus does not require everybody who follows him to sell everything they got and to come on and follow him and take a vow of poverty. He doesn't do that. But what he does expect is that we will trust him more than our bottom line. And that we exhibit that trust through our stewardship, through our generosity, through our willingness to do his work in the world. If we are willing to give lip service to the idea of trusting God, but not willing to do it in real life, if we're willing to trust in our own merits, but not in the merits of God's grace and salvation through Jesus Christ, there's a good chance we're going to miss the opportunity to thread the needle of discipleship like we should. After Jim Carrey, not necessarily a font of wisdom, he had something very poignant to say. He said it a few years ago, and I think it's very, very poignant. He said this. He said, I wish everybody in the world had all the money they wanted, had all the fame they could stand and got to do everything they wanted to do so they could see that it's not the answer. Hmm. Wise words from the voice of experience, I'm sure. Brothers and sisters, if you and I think things that are here today, gone tomorrow, that are stored in a storage facility in Macon, North Carolina are more important than those people who are holding your hand when you're in the hospital, who stand with you at the grave, those people who love you and put their arm around you and, and are there for you when you need them. If the things are more important than those people, if you see those gifts and graces that God's put in your care, your stewardship, as an end, I've got it, rather than as a means by which we can live more faithfully, if you're willing to give lip service to trusting God but not willing to give life service, you might be in danger of missing that needle. And you may need to hear once more the words of our Lord who said, truly, truly, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person, a person that money has a hold of rather than them having hold of money to enter the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, those who have ears, let them hear. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of going forth is hymn number 396 in the hymnals, O Jesus, I have promised. Let us stand and sing to the glory of God.
God bless you. I love you. Have a wonderful week. Remember all that's going on until we're together again. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.